Heavy Metal, a step beyond science fiction, a universe of awesome good and a universe of terrifying evil. Released in 1981, Heavy Metal is an animated anthology movie featuring stories of the past, present and future. A raunchy movie of sex and violence and hard rock. Heavy Metal is quite a unique movie, as it took the animation format which for that time was mainly used for children's movies, and gave the format an unapologetic hard R rated makeover, and held no bars for making it an animated movie aimed at adults, as it goes all out. It shocked some and entertained others, and became a science fiction classic. But what secrets are there to be learned from this strange and unique movie? So today we are going to travel to a universe you've never seen before. Or at least that's what the movie's poster says, as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about heavy metal. Let's check it out. Number 10, based on a comic book magazine. Heavy Metal is based on the magazine of the same name, and just like the film, the magazine offered a cocktail of science fiction action, violence, and erotica. It all started in the mid-70s when American publisher Leonard Mogul visited Paris to try and get a French version of the National Lampoon magazine off the ground. While on his visit, he discovered a magazine called Metal Hurlant, which had been publishing since 1975, and felt that the magazine would translate well for American readers. So in 1977, the magazine was reprinted in the States under the title of Heavy Metal. At first, the magazine was just a reprint of the French version. But after a while, more and more American writers and artists were contributing to the heavy metal magazine, including Dan O'Bannon, who also wrote the movie Alien and Total Recall. The comic was quite daring for its time, as it didn't abide to the strict comic book code of authority that most comics had to follow, probably due to its more extreme and raunchy subject matter. The comic was also a massive influence for co-Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles creator Kevin Eastman, and the comic is still going on even to this day. Number 9 Canadian Production Heavy Metal was indeed made in the Great White North itself, Canada. The movie was directed by Canadian filmmaker and animator Gerald Potterson, who also worked on the animation for the Beatles animated movie Yellow Submarine. Heavy Metal was produced by Ivan Reitman, who is better known for his contributions to comedy movies of that era. Before Heavy Metal, he produced Animal House, as well as directing Meatballs and Stripes. And a few years after Heavy Metal, he directed the well-loved classic Ghostbusters. Heavy Metal even features the voice talents of many famous Canadian stars, such as John Candy and Eugene Levy, and it also features some voice work from Harold Ramis and Joe Flaherty, aka that guy that kept calling Happy Gilmore a jackass. So it's interesting that this violent science fiction noir animated movie had a lot of talent working on it who were most well known for oddball comedies of that time. Number 8 Unique Animation Technique Several scenes of heavy metal use an animation technique called rotoscoping, which is a process that involves tracing over the film of real live-action footage in order to make it look more animated. Rotoscoping isn't a rare technique, and has probably been used more times than people realise. Just a few years before heavy metal, it was used to create the glowing, colourful effects for the lightsabers in Star Wars. It was also featured in the 1979 Lord of the Rings animated movie, and even some scenes in the Disney classic Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The scenes that involve rotoscoping in heavy metal include the infamous scene of the car free falling to Earth in space, and the B-17 bomber in which the sequence was achieved by filming a smaller model of a B-17 bomber and then animating over it through rotoscoping. The house explosion at the end was meant to be rotoscoped, but the film's release got pushed forward from November to August, so there was just no time to animate the scene, leaving the explosion the only shot in the movie to not have any animation. Rotoscoping was considered quite cutting edge for its day, however it was also seen as controversial by some animators, 
who felt that it wasn't real animation and was a quick and easy escape for those who had a lack of talent. Number 7. Heavy Metal used several animation sources. Despite the fact that Heavy Metal was a Canadian production as mentioned, it still featured animation that came from different animation companies from around the world. This is why the animation style in some segments look quite different from one another. But considering the Heavy Metal magazine also featured different styles with its illustrations, it was felt that this went with the Heavy Metal comic book style. A Canadian animation studio called Nelvana Limited were offered to animate the movie, but they dropped out choosing to animate the movie Rock and Roll instead. So just check out that movie if you want to see what Heavy Metal could have looked like. However, having the animation come from several different sources proved to be both cost and time effective, and is now a common practice with animation. Number 6. Deleted Carousel Subplot The segments in Heavy Metal are transitioned via the evil green sphere, otherwise known as Lochner, which some have argued makes the stories feel tied together in a sloppy way. However, in an early draft of the script, the stories were going to be linked together in a very different way. Originally, the younger version of Tana would find a magical merry-go-round carousel, and she would witness each segment by taking a spin on the mystical play equipment, which, although would have been weird, still probably would have gelled the stories together a little more smoothly. Despite the fact that the Harry Canyon, Captain Stern, and Den segments were all based on stories from the Heavy Metal magazine, the Tana segment at the end was an original story written specifically for the movie. Call me crazy though, I actually do kind of like the magical carousel idea. As weird as it is. Number 5. Recycling Music The score for Heavy Metal was composed by movie scoring legend Elmer Bernstein, which comes as no surprise as Heavy Metal was an Ivan Reitman production, and Bernstein had previously scored Animal House and Stripes, and would go on to score Reitman's big hit Ghostbusters. In fact, the same year Bernstein scored Heavy Metal, he also scored the as mentioned Stripes and An American Werewolf in London, as well as Honky Tonky Freeway, Going Ape, and The Chosen. So needless to say, 1981 was a big year for Bernstein, Maybe he was a little too busy, as the theme that Bernstein provided for the Tana character was actually a piece of music Bernstein had written for the movie Saturn 3, which came out one year earlier. But that piece of music that he wrote was never used, so he used it for heavy metal. And as always, Bernstein's music for heavy metal is mesmerizing and exciting. And apart from epic movie scores and oddball comedies, he actually creates some pretty good science fiction sounds. It's actually a shame that he didn't do more science fiction movies. Number 4. Soundtrack Woes So considering the movie is called Heavy Metal, the production wanted to make sure they got some pretty rocking tunes in the movie, which included songs from the likes of Black Sabbath and Devo. In fact, one thing that stands out about Heavy Metal to many of its fans is its awesome soundtrack. However, its soundtrack would also become its undoing, as due to copyright issues surrounding many of the songs that featured in Heavy Metal, the movie couldn't get an initial home media VHS release. Only in 1996, 15 years after the movie's cinematic release, could Heavy Metal finally get an official VHS and Laserdisc release. And this is all thanks to the as-mentioned Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as in 1992 he bought the publishing rights of the Heavy Metal magazine and managed to reach an agreement with the holders of the songs used in the movie so Heavy Metal could get a commercial release. It was a similar dilemma for the soundtrack of the movie too, which couldn't get a CD release till 1995. Interestingly, the band Blue Oyster Club recorded a song for Heavy Metal called Vengeance, but the song was rejected by the production as they felt it gave too much away about the Tana character. So they created the song Veteran of the Psych Ward, which was used in Heavy Metal instead. Number 3. Sequel There was in fact a sequel to Heavy Metal which came out in the year 2000, appropriately called Heavy Metal 2000, and it featured voice work from the likes of Michael Ironside and Billy Idol. The story of Heavy Metal 2000 is actually based on a graphic novel series called The Melting Pot, which was first published in 1993 and was co-written by Kevin Eastman. Just like its predecessor, Heavy Metal 2000 is an animated feature, mainly produced in Canada, and it was torn apart by critics and has largely become a forgotten film, although no doubt it still has its fan base. 
It's just that no one really talks about this one as much as the original. Heck, I didn't even know there was a sequel till making this episode. There was talks of making a third movie after the release of Heavy Metal 2000, but it got stuck in development hell and never ended up happening. I think it's a shame that Heavy Metal 2000 didn't take off, as despite its flaws, there was a potential good movie there. It just needed a bit more of a poke in the right direction. Number two, the failed remake led to a Netflix miniseries. In 2008, there was a planned remake of Heavy Metal, which was to be released by Paramount Pictures and was to be directed by David Fincher. But Paramount didn't like Fincher's edgy take, so they dropped the project. Kevin Eastman said that many directors wanted to direct a heavy metal movie, from Zack Snyder to Guillermo del Toro. Then it was believed that Sony were going to back the movie, with both Eastman and James Cameron acting as co-producers, and there was even going to be a Jack Black cameo. But then the project was dropped. Then in 2011, Robert Rodriguez said that he bought the rights to heavy metal and was going to produce a new movie. But that production was also met with problems, where in 2014, Rodriguez was considering switching from a movie to a TV series. And after more stalling, finally in 2019, the project evolved into the Netflix series Love, Death and Robots, which is kind of connected to the heavy metal brand, but ultimately its own thing. The animated anthology series features 18 episodes, which range from being 6 to 17 minutes long, with each episode being made up of a mainly different cast and crew. The series was met with a positive reception, with it being described as Black Mirror for the video game crowd, and even won several awards, including two Emmys. Well, it took a long time, and yet we still didn't get a heavy metal continuation or remake. But hey, we still got something, and what we got seems to be pretty good. Number 1. Release Heavy Metal was released in August 1981 and made just over $20 million on a $9.7 million budget, so its box office wasn't spectacular, but it did bring in a tidy little profit. Not bad considering it was released the same month as an American werewolf in London. It was, however, the highest grossing Canadian movie ever made. That is until the following year when Porky's came along. It got pretty decent reviews from critics, who praised the movie's animation and music, as well as its presentation of a comic book coming to life on the big screen. Its use of visuals and storytelling told through flashy animation felt unique. It did, however, get some criticisms for sexism and violence reasons, with a Los Angeles Times review describing it as, quote, the most expensive adolescent fantasy revenge fulfillment wet dream ever to sliver onto a screen. Whether you liked the movie or not, I think the production of Heavy Metal were trying to create a unique cinematic experience, something that hadn't been done much before that point. To take an adult comic full of violence and erotica and recreate it onto the big screen. And its use of animation makes it feel like a living comic book exploding to life on the big screen. It was a brave movie for a post-Star Wars era, where there were tons of space-age science fiction movies that were all filmed in live action, with productions that probably wouldn't have dreamed to film their movies in animation. Over the years, the popularity of heavy metal has increased, making it a cult movie, with fans who adore heavy metal. Naturally, the movie isn't for everyone, but I think that there is an appreciation for this movie, for trying to do something for its time that was quite different. Something that stands out and gives a lasting impression, guaranteeing that it will be remembered. Yeah, I'm not a massive fan of heavy metal. I understand that lots of people love it, but personally, I find the story a little weak. But if it's ever on TV, I'll always watch it and enjoy it. I think that what appeals to me the most about heavy metal is its craft, as its animation is definitely what makes it stand out from other science fiction movies of that time. So that's my evaluation. Not for everyone, but those who do like it get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I still can't believe it took heavy metal 15 years to get a VHS release. That is insane. See ya!